Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters and today we have another treat in store for you because Stuart Owen is back to talk through a failed EIS investment he made. Now Stuart is unfortunately subject to various confidentiality agreements which is very interesting in itself and so we're going to be quite coy about both the name of the company he invested in and the broker he invested via. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thanks, Keith. Nice to see you again, Stuart. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. The view of any guests you may have on the show are entirely their own and may not be representative of the views of Portfolio Matters. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Take it away, Stuart. Right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Richard. Um, so this was uh, an EIS investment I made, which made an almost... Um, total loss for the equity investors at least. Um, uh, so I thought it'd be useful for people to hear my experience um, following on from the overall EIS and VCT review I did um, earlier in the Portfolio, Portfolio Matters series. So just a reminder of what an EIS is. It's an enterprise investment scheme investment, uh, which the government um, has set up as an umbrella scheme to encourage investment in new small companies. So the companies have to have gross assets of less than 15 million, less than 250 employees. And there's, I think, an age of company limit. I think it's about seven years. Uh, and having made the investment, you must hold it for at least three years. Th those are the rules. Um, because of the risk of investing in new small companies, um, the enticement for that is some pretty big tax savings. So if you invest 100 quid into an EIS company, you'll get 30 quid off your income tax bill. You'll also be able to defer capital gains. Any losses you make um, are tax allowable and any gains you make are tax free. So despite the uh, exhortation that we always hear never to do anything just for tax reasons, it is fairly attractive to do so. Yes. But it can go wrong and has done in, um, in various cases, including the one I'm about to highlight. So the proposition, the pitch, uh, occurred or, or began in 2014, but in fact, it was a rolling pitch. The idea was to set up a string of nurseries where each nursery would be an individual company and each individual company would be an EIS investment in itself. Now, uh, the idea was to set this up in affluent parts of London, where there would be big demand for nursery places and premium fees could be charged. So the idea was uh, for the, each company to find a suitable building, acquire it, refurbish it and you know, set up a nursery. And the um, idea, the pitch would, had credibility because uh, there was some pretty experienced management. In particular, a chap called Bill Zuckerman, who'd founded a company called Active Learning. And he'd also had quite a bit of uh, consultancy experience at Ernst & Young. So I assumed he had a fair bit of you know, financial nous and experience. And in fact, he had opened previously nine separate other nurseries. Uh, the promoter of the, the scheme, the intermediary, the broker, um, was uh, saying that they were going to do due diligence on the location of the nursery, on the property itself, and on the management. And the exit route was, was plausible. The idea was to, to roll these up and sell them as a block, uh, as a group, um, to a private equity company when there, there was a bit more heft to the business. And so sell all the individual companies as one portfolio. That was the story. Now, it was very important to pay attention to the capital structure, what was uh, on offer, because the equity investors were putting in, you know, pretty much all the equity. And they were being promised, or not promised, they were being, it was proposed, it was estimated, um, 
on the exit assumptions that you would make one and a half times your invested capital plus all the tax breaks that I highlighted before. But underneath the equity, there was uh, some loans and these loans were secured against the value of the properties. And the loans were at about 80% loan to pre-development value, i.e. You know, if they were buying um, a property for 2 million to refurbish, it was the, the uh, loan would be about 1.6 million. And that became only 60% loan to value if you compared the, the, the loan to the value, expected value after the redevelopment and refurbishment. Now these loans were paying eight to 9% interest. So that looked pretty interesting in itself. One thing that I think everyone should be aware of is the dilution risk that um, you suffer with some of these structures for EIS. Uh, management wasn't putting in any capital as far as I could see, but would end up with 22% of the fully diluted um, shareholders. And the promoter was going to get 15%. So they were going to you know, get a good chunk of the upside without putting much um, cash equity in. They were putting in, in a sense, sweat equity. They were doing uh, the management, obviously, and they were doing the sourcing of the deal from my point of view. Having said that, these are... Uh, fully diluted uh, shares were only beginning to dilute you after you got your money back. So it was a dilution of the profit, not a dilution overall, which I thought was a reasonable trade-off. So that was the pitch, that was the, the capital structure. And I thought that looked like a, a reasonable bet, you know, given that this was an enterprise investment scheme. Uh, so how did it play out? Well, initially, you know, there were there were problems, but I thought they were sort of normal business risks. The the sites uh, for the nurseries were slow to be identified and purchased. There was a lot of hanging around waiting for uh, a purchase. I think of it was a place in Croydon, and then I think there was another place in Stanmore that were identified. Um, but you know, for one reason or another, the transaction didn't come through. So this um, led to delay which I think is a big issue with almost every EIS I've invested in. Uh, but finally, um, two sites, one in Finchley and then later a second company based in Muswell Hill, were progressed. And after having bought the properties and begun the uh, refurbishment, there were delays. Um, now, again, to me, they didn't seem you know, totally unreasonable delays. There were council planning issues. There was issues of getting contractors um, assigned and aligned for the work. And I thought, okay, this is all just you know, par for the course, nothing ever runs smoothly when it's got anything to do with construction. But in retrospect, the, the troubles were perhaps more serious than, than, had, than I interpreted the uh, information updates as, as being. So there were pretty extensive disputes with contractors, uh, contractors who left, um, and uh, did not return to the job. There were pretty substantial cost overruns as well. And these cost overruns led to a specialist surveyor being brought in to oversee the contracts and to review progress. Now, I should have been thinking that um, a, a surveyor a, a should have been on the board already, but there wasn't. Now, things went from bad to worse when it turned out that, in fact, there was outright fraud going on, where funds from one nursery were being used to pay for work on another nursery. So the, the accounts were basically fraudulent. And this all culminated in uh, the suicide of Bill Zuckerman, the guy who was the energy and the driving force behind uh, the whole nursery project. So the outcome financially, well, a lot of the problems were at the Finchley site, and that was sold. But it was sold to another company within the promoter's stable. Now, the money from the, uh, the sale of the property at Finchley made the loan investors whole. They got back everything plus their interest. Now, again, as a sort of modest private investor, you don't have much leverage, you don't have much access to information. And the fact that it was being sold to a company within the promoter's stable of other companies that it was um, that it had brought to market 
you know, it, it leaves a slight bad taste in the mouth, but what are you going to do? Um, uh, so equity investors were, uh, sorry, just, just to, to be clear about this, there, there was a, a, an opinion given that this was a, a fair value, but you know, what do you know? So the loan investors, they were in a senior position. They did get their money back plus you know, that reasonably attractive interest. Equity investors, however, they were hosed. They got back just six pence. So from the equity investor's point of view, you got 6p in the pound from the equity investment itself. But because this was an EIS, the losses were pretty heavily cushioned. You got back another 30 pence from the initial income tax uh, deduction. And then the losses, and the loss here um, would be 64 pence because the loss is taken to be your net investment cost, i.e. 70p in the pound after the 30, 30 pence interest uh, in, uh, income tax deduction uh, minus the, the capital you actually got back, the 6p. So the loss is, is calculated as 64 pence and that is also tax allowable at whether your marginal rate was 40 or 45 pence uh, per percent. So you got back another 26 to 29 pence um, via the loss relief. But uh, another issue I found with many EIS investments is you really don't know about the timing. You might be planning your, your, your tax strategy in a particular year, and you might think, aha, well, I've got this loss relief, I can use that, but you need it to be crystallized at a predictable time. And now this six pence that was returned was returned as a return of capital and not as a share sale. And that meant that it wasn't a tax crystallizing event as it happened. The tax, the tax loss was crystallized later when the company was dissolved. Now, there's nothing much the promoter can do about, about such a thing, but you just have to be aware that it, it makes tax planning uh, difficult. You, you don't quite know which tax year uh, the losses are gonna be allocated to. Now, there were, of course, uh, um, legal cases that resulted from this, you know, that this had been outright fraud, um, but uh, cases of, uh, for key man insurance came to nothing, as did the prospect of suing the professional service providers. Now that was the, the Finchley site, the Muswell Hill uh, company uh, also ended up being uh, delayed and over budget. And so there were issues of cash flow, which meant that the loan interest on uh, for the property purchase for that company were temporarily reduced and, and later paid back. And equity investors uh, got back something uh, rather better uh, from that one. So the, the lessons, well, Single companies are risky. Um, it, uh, I know we all know it, and we, we keep being told it, but a single company was a single point of failure. So I think that the big consequence of this is adjust your bet size. It don't, don't go too heavy on any individual uh, EIS. Of course, that, that can work the other way. Um, the same promoter uh, was also responsible for introducing me to um, a company which became my only ever 10 bagger in my investment career. So th this might be a statement of the obvious, but small companies are risky. But what are the differences between an EIS small company investment and something like a, a Keith a Spivy commodity stock is that it is totally illiquid. You might see the train coming towards you, you might want to get out, but there's no getting out at any price. At least, you know, with, with the Spivy commodity stock, there's a market, you might not like the price, but you can probably you know, begin to edge your way out and, and do something. Here, you know, you are a passenger on, on a train and you cannot get off, even if you hit, see it heading towards the buffers. Uh, there's also the information of, uh, the, the question of information opacity. You get what you're given. Um, you're a small shareholder in a small company. Um, there's an intermediary who's um, your source of information. And you, you, in some cases, get very little information. I've invested in other EISs, um, for instance, in the film world. And you, you just get a bit of flim flam about you know, the, the actors who are in the, in the show or how they're hoping to distribute it. But you get very little about the financials. Uh, another uh, issue that I've had is that the business model can and does change and you have no say. 
So it wasn't a particularly big issue in this case. Um, they did say they were going to set up a nursery and they did do that, but it wasn't the initially intended nursery. It was a, a, you know, a couple of properties further down the line. But I've had other cases where the business model has changed and you know, you've paid over your money, the management is setting up its business and it may decide to, to go somewhere else. Um, another point is fees are high and they're a sunk cost and they keep on ticking away. Um, so the equity payback on the uh, company that was set up for, a Muswell, for the Muswell Hill nursery, the payback estimated there shrunk from 40 pence to 35%, uh, 35 pence as the delays in the wind up and delays in resolution uh, went on. And uh, I've had issues with other promoters as well where you know, pretty substantial fees um, of course, are just never rebated, um, even in other cases where they've gone to zero. Uh, there's also the issue of delays. I've referred to it uh, already. Um, I've never had an EIS pay back within the three year or at the end of the three year holding period. Much more common is five to six years, which is actually in line with a venture capital trust rules and venture capital trusts, um, as I was making the case for in the previous video, are much simpler administratively and are much more diversified. The tax breaks are less good, but it, it's a much simpler proposition. And I'd finally say that um, the idea that the promoter has a board member supposedly looking out for your interests, well, it, it's a pretty thin protection. Uh, when, um, after the suicide of Bill Zuckerman and they went in to, to look at the, the accounts and they started to sort of see what had been going on, um, on, for back of the envelope calculations from a surveyor about what the cost of a refurb of a building such as they were intending to do would be, they found that the whole estimated budget was an order of magnitude less than the likely cost of the refurb. So there was no real speciality on the board uh, protecting you. Well, thank you, Stuart. That's really interesting. I uh, asked Stuart to put this together because I have actually invested with this broker and I remember seeing these deals coming through and Stuart then told me what had happened, but I had absolutely no knowledge of what had happened to those schemes. And it struck me that there's just a whole lack of information on deals that go wrong. So they don't have to report on how the stable has done in aggregate all they do is show you the deals that have gone well and so you have a very biased view of the success of these eis investments and so i thought it was really interesting to actually have stuart talk through his experience of one that's gone wrong now i had some other thoughts um is that richard and i do some uh, angel investing and the key thing we've learned is that the entrepreneur is absolutely key. You have to like him and think he can drive that business forward. And did you actually manage to meet the entrepreneur? I didn't, but the thing is, I know that I tend to be over sympathetic to someone making a pitch. Yeah. So um, having been a sort of traditional fund manager and met lots of management, I, I sort of didn't trust my own judgment about that sort of thing. So I, I let myself be led by the fact that he had relevant industry experience and he had relevant general financial experience. So I, I know that I, I can be a bit of a, a sucker for a, a smooth salesman with, with a confident story. So I, I didn't. Mm. But the, well, the other thing is you probably only get to meet him once. And, you know, in our experience of doing angel investments, you really have to see them again and again over the course of a while, see how their story develops to gain some trust in them. And in here, essentially, you are trusting the broker to have done all that due diligence for you. And it strikes me that, you know, this quote they had for the refurbishment when it had all gone belly up revealed that actually very little due diligence had been done. It's like the broker has essentially trusted the entrepreneur for everything and it gets paid. You know, if it raises the money, it gets paid. 
And does it, you know, what's the downside? Apart from to the few investors who've actually invested in this deal, you know, nobody knows that it's been a disaster. I think the, um, I agree with you, Keith, and, and thank you very much for sharing this, this issue with us, Stuart. The, um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's pros and cons, aren't there? If you directly invest as an angel investor with the EIS investment, you are closer to the company. Uh, you, you do know, potentially know more, um, but you have to go around and do quite a lot of work to dig them out. If you go through a broker, you're further away from the company and by um, inference, you're relying upon the expertise of the broker to introduce you to good companies, but the, you don't actually know whether they're able to do that. And there is an incentive for the broker to invest the money, clearly, uh, particularly as the tax year comes to a close. So it's a little, little bit like he pays your money, he takes your choice. Personally, I prefer to do it myself because I feel I have a bit more control. But of course, the issues of the, um, the uh, entrepreneur basically getting it all wrong doesn't go away. And the broker, if it, if it is all going all wrong, there's probably not a great deal the broker can do at that point. Yeah, because uh, one of the things that struck me as we went through was the fact you're aware that there are issues, but by that stage, you've committed the money. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it at that stage. You just have to watch the ship sinking, don't you? Yeah. The mm. other thing I'd say is actually Stuart did all right out of this deal because you invested in the loan, I believe. Uh, that was by far my larger investment was in the loan. Right. That's right. Um, I did have a, a small amount of the, the equity, so I, I know the story there. But uh, in that sense, fortunately, my bet size was calibrated with the risk. Because the thing is, when we went, you went through the economics, you know, they're talking about a target return of one and a half times. And to me, that's just not enough, you know, because you're, you're taking a lot of, as you say, risk in a startup with all the development problems, which came true, actually. And your reward is one and a half times over like five years. I'll well, definitely is, take the loan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought the loan was a pretty attractive risk return. The, the idea of 80% loan to value um, at 8 9% interest, plus you know that to the equity holders' money has been used to refurbish and improve the property. Did, did just to make clear, so just to make clear, Richard, uh, Keith, the one and a half was one, one and a half times, say you put in 100 quid, the, the pitch was you'd make 150 quid, hmm. but you could argue that's 150 quid on 70 quid because you've got the 30% um, income tax rebate. And often the promoters will present their numbers of return compared to your net investment costs, not your actual investment costs. Which I think is very cheeky because they're making assumptions about your tax status and saying it's their, their skill that has given you that benefit. Couldn't agree more, yeah. So was, it, was the loan secured uh, for first charge on the property, Stuart? Yes, so that was a pretty secure position. And so you got 100% back of the principal in the loan? Plus the interest, yeah. Very good. Because the other thing I would say is that actually the EIS tax breaks worked pretty well as long as you had the income tax to offset against these losses, you would have recovered over 60p in the pound, despite the fact it was actually a pretty much 100% write off. So, you know, it is quite, it is an invest, a, an attractive scheme. The only time I would invest in these startups is if there's an SEIS or an EIS tax scheme behind it. I wouldn't do it without those protections. That, that is true. Um, but uh, yeah, well, there is the issue of, of paperwork as well, which I have come back to uh, on, on a few occasions. The, the, the juggling between different tax years and, and reporting these losses and claiming them that they're all there, it's all totally fine for you to claim them, but um, it, it is complex on your, on your tax return. Yes, and the other thing I would say, in addition to the paperwork, is there's time. Because you did get 60p back, but you got 60p back, what, five or six years later? Yeah. Not great. You know, no. but be obviously better than nothing in um, a company went completely uh, belly up. Okay, well, 
thank you very much to Stuart for sharing that story with us and if anyone else has a my worst trade that they'd like to share with our audience I always enjoy these so well uh, please get in touch in the meantime please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and it's goodbye from all of us goodbye, goodbye. full disclaimer the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.